Hi, my name is Corey D'Augustine, and I'd like to be the first to welcome you to this course where we'll be studying the materials and techniques of New York School painting together. Just a quick word about myself. I am an art historian, I'm a conservator, and an artist as well, so I'll be bringing these different perspectives in as much as possible to the course. So let's begin by talking about who or what exactly the New York School was. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this is not really a school at all with a campus in the traditional sense. Instead, we're talking about a very interdisciplinary movement, uh, painters and sculptors, but we're also talking about poets, uh, writers, dancers, uh, musicians, composers, etc. So we're talking about a very interesting moment in uh, not only art history, but New York history begins somewhere in the 1930s and stretches somewhere into the 60s or maybe even the 70s. So where did it take place mostly? Well, down in Greenwich Village uh, here in New York City, in lower Manhattan, uh, an area that at the time was very inexpensive. So all of these different kinds of artists really all lived within walking distance of uh, one another, which goes a long way to understanding how this movement really cross-fertilized itself and became so rich so quickly. There wasn't a campus per se, but in fact there were three places that really uh, the New York School took place at, we could say. Uh, one of them is, in fact, a bar. We're talking about the Cedar Bar, a tavern that no longer exists, unfortunately, uh, but a place where uh, many of the uh, painters, specifically, of the New York School would gather literally on a nightly basis. Well, around the corner from the Cedar Bar was a place called the Club. And if the Cedar Bar was a bit of a riotous place, the Club was a much more serious, academic, civilized kind of a place uh, where uh, you'd give a nickel at the door and you would have a, a meeting where the business was art. Uh, and the question here was how, as Americans, can we be taken seriously as modern artists? Because at that time, the idea of a modern American art movement was almost laughable since uh, the Europeans dominated the modern art worldwide and Paris was the unquestioned center of modern creative activity. I'd be remiss here if we didn't talk about the role of the third part of the campus, so to speak, uh, and that's the Museum of Modern Art. Part of the reason why these artists were able to grow up so quickly is because they had one of the greatest collections of modern uh, art in the world to look at as often as they wanted to. So as we're looking at this image, we have actually a pretty high percentage of the New York School painters here in one room, and this is the club. Willem de Kooning, perhaps the leader of uh, this movement. I say perhaps because there wasn't one leader, but I think if we took a vote, most of these characters would uh, nod in de Kooning's direction. Ad Reinhardt, an oppositional figure, uh, later would become known as the father of minimalism. And this figure here is Alfred Barr, who's not an artist at all. He's an academic, and he was the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art. MoMA is founded in uh, 1929. You're looking at the cover of a catalog, Cubism and Abstract Art. Uh, this is an exhibition at MoMA in 1936. This really is the background through which we'll be exploring the New York School. And these are the influences, uh, are most of the influences, that the New York School uh, was working their own way through. Cubism, the work of Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque, centered in Paris but quickly becoming a dominant uh, modern art movement throughout Europe and elsewhere. Uh, here in Picasso's 1912 painting, The Architect's Table, uh, you see a late Cubist work. Uh, the uh, division of the pictorial surface here, uh, a very shallow space in which this composition is densely enmeshed. Uh, these are some very important references for Willem de Kooning, uh, but not only de Kooning, since uh, Jackson Pollock was also deeply interested in Cubism, and for Pollock even more so in Surrealism. Surrealism, a movement also European, uh, which is deeply indebted to the thinking of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, an interest in the dream state versus the waking state, perhaps other realities out there, not just the one that we inhabit with our eyes open. Well, here, a painting by Yves Tanguy. Uh, this is one of my favorite titles in the history of modern painting. Mama, Papa is Wounded of 1927. Uh, uh, some artists with a sense of humor. A sense of humor is something that is a bit lacking for many of the New York School artists as they are deadly serious, deadly intent on moving the capital of the art world from Paris here to New York City. They got a hand in that process because thanks to World War II, many of uh, Europe's greatest, not only painters, but thinkers, moved 
here to New York City. Uh, in fact, Yves Tanguy, the painter of this image here, just lived uptown from uh, many of the New York School artists who lived downtown. Pete Mondrian, whose homage to New York City, Broadway Boogie Woogie, painted in uh, 1942 and the following year, also moved uh, from the chaos of World War II in Europe to the relative calm of New York City. Mondrian also was very much accessible. Not only could the New York School artists go to MoMA uh, to see Mondrian's works, but they could have a beer with him and learn modernism from one of the living sources of uh, that movement. Hans Hoffmann and his ally Josef Albers, uh, these are two of the great color theorists and great painting uh, instructors of the 20th century. Both of them are German, and both of them immigrated here to New York City. Hoffmann set up a school downtown. Josef Albers here, we're looking at one of his many paintings called Homage to the Square. Albers uh, was deeply interested in how colors are interdependent because the same color will look different in your eye depending on what color it's adjacent to. Now let's switch from Alfred Barr's uh, chart, mapping out all of the influences of cubism and abstract art, to a kind of satire, an ironization of that chart. This one penned by Ad Reinhardt. Reinhardt was an art historian himself, not only of European modernism, but of European old master painting and of East Asian, uh, and we're talking specifically about Chinese and Japanese classicisms. Reinhardt uh, was interested in Asian calligraphy and uh, these classical painting traditions. We'll find that influence working its way into the gestural paintings of the New York school. Uh, and Reinhardt was also interested in philosophy, uh, specifically in Zen or Chan Buddhism. Uh, and this came to New York City, a very fertile moment, thanks to a teacher named Daisette Suzuki. Suzuki was the first significant Zen teacher here on the East Coast in the United States. Uh, and many of the artists uh, that we'll talk about in this course, uh, most so Agnes Martin and Ad Reinhardt, were deeply influenced by this way of thinking as well. We'd also be remiss not to mention a Southern influence. Let's not forget that the influence of the great Mexican muralists uh, is a huge impact on uh, the New York school here. We're looking at a painting called Collective Suicide, uh, 1936, painted by David Alfaro Siqueiros. Uh, Siqueiros here did most of his work in Mexico, but in 1936 sets up his own school, the Siqueiros Experimental Workshop. His prized pupil, Jackson Pollock. What did they do in this experimental workshop? Well, anything new with materials and techniques. Uh, getting rid of the uh, old, getting rid of the European, no more fine oil paints and fine brushes, etc., no more delicacy. Uh, instead, working class materials, industrial materials, enamel paints, spray paint, using stencils, throwing paint, flinging paint. If this begins to sound a little bit like Jackson Pollock, you might be on to something. Let's take a look at another one of the iconic photos of the New York School, uh, this one called the Irascibles. Well, we're talking, after all, about an avant-garde, a self-defined movement where the practitioners, the artists here that we're speaking about, consider themselves outside of society. In other words, society doesn't understand them, and that's a good thing. This is their critical distance. This is the way they define their strength, and it's an oppositional one. Now, the irascibles, and let's uh, just talk about that word for a second. Irascible means angry or pissed off, something like that. What were they irascible about? An exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum that championed new American painting. Well, as you might imagine, none of these artists were in that show, hence their irascibility. Uh, who are these artists? Well, let's introduce a couple new faces here. There's Barnett Newman. Here's Mark Rothko. And front and center, of course, here's Jackson Pollock posing, cigarette dangling, this, Jackson Pollock's one number 31 of 1950, is really progressive new American painting. This is the kind of thing that they thought should have been recognized by the Metropolitan Museum. One of the stories of this course is that this was a struggle. Uh, it was a struggle from the get-go, and it was a very, very difficult moment for these artists to build themselves an avant-garde in New York City that really was not ready for one. Uh, this goes a long way into understanding how aggressive these artists had to be, how headstrong, in other words. Uh, and this is also the story of how New York did become the center of the art world. So what are the ideas that are being explored in uh, this New York School uh, group of painters that was so 
un-European or what was so new. As a way to understand this, let's introduce two of the most important art historians who are associated with this movement. Harold Rosenberg was a poet, as a matter of fact, a New York school poet, and his way to understand what was so interesting, what was so new about the New York school painting was called action painting. Rosenberg was thinking about the gestures, the physical movements, how the body moved in space, and how the painting was a kind of recorded image of that event. In other words, something performative transpired, and the painting is the leftovers, the reminder of something that occurred. In Jackson Pollock, we're talking about the torso, the hips, the knees, the shoulders, the wrists, the elbow, etc., the entire body dramatically uh, uh, inserting itself uh, into the presence of this painting. On to Clement Greenberg. Uh, Greenberg's central drive is a term called medium specificity. For Greenberg, and by the way, for Ad Reinhardt and some of the other artists we'll study together, uh, the role of a painter in the 1940s, in the 1950s, was to purify painting of anything external to it. In other words, get rid of subject matter. And here, if we look back at that Reinhardt image of the tree, it's subject matter that is uh, weighing down this bow uh, of the tree into the dustbin of history populated by, well, Encyclopedia Britannica and uh, non-art sources like that. Well, already in this brief introduction, uh, I think we can agree that this is some extraordinarily rich subject matter, and uh, I'm looking forward to exploring this together over the coming weeks.